It may be the most addictive toy in history. Nintendo. 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 The Nintendo Entertainment System. When thinking of video games, the first thing that always comes to mind is Nintendo. The Japanese giant has always had a stronghold of the video game industry for as long as people can remember, but that wasn't always the case. In the late 70s to early 1980s, console manufacturers like Coleco, Magnavox, Intellivision, and especially Atari all ruled the space with an iron fist, transforming the landscape from a weekend novelty at the arcade to a prominent part in the household of families all across the world. However, due to a variety of unfortunate business circumstances, the severity of which was not anticipated by anyone, the whole industry went from valuing at over $3.2 billion in its peak to nearly 5% of that two years later. The poor quality and reckless business approaches led to a massive recession that nearly killed the entertainment medium as we knew it. And just when everyone was about to give up on video games being nothing more than a child's plaything, an overseas arcade company saw the potential in home consoles and took the risk to pick up the scraps left from the industry, turning it completely on its head and allowing the rest of Japan to take over the world completely by storm through the quantity and quality that the West could never even dream of. That overseas company being none other than Nintendo of Japan. The year is 1982. The home console market is at an all-time high, porting arcade games to their consoles to tremendous success, as well as licensing games from popular media and IP, such as Superman, Popeye, and Indiana Jones. This year, the hot ticket item was Steven Spielberg's newest international sensation, E.T. As soon as the box office figures started to show, Atari, the current world leader in the console market by a wide margin, knew that they had a golden opportunity on their hands. They quickly acquired the license to make a video game out of the movie and put programmer Howard Scott Warshaw in charge of developing the game, who previously made some of Atari's best-selling games. However, due to the wish to take advantage of the holiday season spike, they gave Warshaw only five weeks to finish the development on the game, something that typically takes six to eight months to fully complete. The game ended up releasing completely unfinished and messy, and although initially a success, the returns and complaints started pouring in from all over the globe, flying in the face of the once predicted hundred million dollar success. The damage dealt was so severe that Atari had to lay off 80% of all their employees, as well as being forced to bury nearly 800,000 copies of unsold games in New Mexico landfills, something that was not confirmed until an excavation in 2014 and an interview with then Atari manager James Heller, thus commencing the video game crash of 1983. Atari's ET was only the tip of the iceberg, and a lot of true causes of the crash were much more underlying, culminating into the production of the game. Professionals and analysts, even Atari's own CEO, Ray Kassar, knew that the market was bloated and oversaturated and that it would eventually cause the downfall of the industry, but they they all overshot their predictions and ended up paying the price for it. Most of the games that were saturating the market were all made poorly by third-party knockoffs who all wanted a piece of that easy money video game market pie. With no quality control or reassurance, the average consumer lost valuable trust in the manufacturers for publishing and allowing these knockoffs on their expensive systems. Personal computers were starting to pick up traction around this time, and consumers often picked the computer's versatility and utility for both games and work, leading to even less support from console manufacturers. Within the span of just three years, the entire video game industry deflated in value to a fraction of a fraction of what it was worth. If anyone was interesting in gambling millions, they would be completely out of their mind. After World War II, Japan was left in an odd position. After losing the war and Emperor Hirohito's collapsing empire, Japan's post-war struggle was an enormous hurdle for the nation to overcome, but they knew exactly how to do it. Because of Japan's lack of natural resources, they had to rely on trade for as long as their history dates, so they were no strangers to situations like this. Japanese goods and exports, such as equipment, instruments, and soon-to-be electronics and computers, were met by high global demand, allowing them to both experience renewed economic stability and engage with foreign market trends, one such being the rise in consumer electronics. 
Nintendo, a card and toy company from the late 1800s, attempted to diversify its business to arcades and electronics to unprecedented success. They later made contact with the home console market domestically and internationally, but not before testing the waters with the Game & Watch series of handheld systems. Seeing the potential that this medium had, even after the market crash that doomed the industry, they went on to develop a brand new, state-of-the-art home console that would take serious measures into protecting it from the exact causes that led to the original collapse. The Famicom, short for Family Computer, as they did not want it to be considered a toy, was launched on July 15, 1983. Originally only released domestically, Nintendo aimed at first gauging consumer interest and making necessary adjustments before taking the plunge to the globe. With all of this build-up and all of this preparation, the real turning point came when the Famicom was later launched in North America as the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES for short, on September 27, 1986. The calculated approaches to the way this console was marketed and produced all contributed to the overwhelming success that the NES found. From the heavily monitored game library and third-party support, the partnerships with retailers, the piracy and protection chips, to even small details like the box art showing actual graphics or simple designs instead of the detailed and misleading art consoles like Atari used before. This is the moment where everything changed, and it only goes up from here. The achievement of the NES, and Nintendo as a whole, was not one that was kept just to them. Although laying the groundwork to build their empire with the success and iconic power of Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Donkey Kong, Metroid, and many others, the ripple effect that was catalyzed by the NES affected so much more than just a company in the East Asian archipelago. The entire nation of Japan suddenly exploded into dominating the consumer electronics market for the foreseeable future, as well as supplying Nintendo with their fair share of competition in the form of the Sega Master System, released in Japan in October 1985 and in North America in September of 1986. While not making as big of a splash as the NES did, it gave them the resources, experience, and foundation to create a worthy successor two years later, the Sega Genesis that truly pushed Nintendo to check its top spot and gave us the now famous icon, Sonic the Hedgehog. The back and forth between the two would further intensify as the Super Famicom, or Super Nintendo Entertainment System in the West, rolled out in the early 90s, using newly updated 16-bit graphics and hardware on par with the Genesis' short-lived edge on computer specifications. Even Atari would come back and attempt a do-over, however, they were not nearly as successful as the red and blue giants of the space were. The entertainment medium of video games was back, and they were here to stay. As the generations passed and more of the world was exposed to the medium and its market, more and more ideas, companies, games, and consoles jumped into the arena. Some of them stuck and still remain mainstays, while others were relegated to a product of their time. However many though, video games will still continue to garner attention and respect as a medium worth being crowned the biggest entertainment industry in the entire world. Video games have always been something special. Even if the people behind it and the people consuming it were not fully on board, it was always apparent from the start how far this emerging technology would come. Even after a global economic collapse, it still managed to get up on its feet and shine brighter than ever before. Japan is now both a juggernaut in the gaming space as well as a pop culture icon with its art, culture, and people. Mario, and by extension Nintendo, is one of the most recognizable faces the entire world over. Video games have evolved into so much more than their humble beginnings now, with lines being blurred in between entirely different mediums colliding into one. There are very few turning points in history that combine cultural, economic, diplomatic, and artistic impact globally, yet the previously unsophisticated bleeps and bloops that bounced off the end of TV sets have morphed and blossomed into being worth more than the film and music industries combined. However, only time will tell if video games will continue to hold a candle to the generations that succeed us and continue to connect and unite all of us until the stage is cleared. Thank you for watching.